thank you, Nico. It's been a great two days, now two and a half days. Uh, again, I'm David Rouse. I'm the research director for the American Planning Association. I'm joined by a distinguished panel of academics. My role in this is as moderator. I'm the only non-academic on the panel, so you will hear from me again on the panel after this, the professionals panel. So uh, uh, again, Nico said we're focusing on research. However, when we had our discussion preparing for this panel, we thought we'd amend that charge a little bit and just think about the role of academy, teaching, curricula, and research in sort of dealing with and getting in front of and helping, uh, hel helping students and, and you know, others ad address these uh, disruptive emerging technologies. So what we're gonna do is I have a series of questions. Actually, I'm gonna ask each panelist to make an opening, just a brief opening statement and uh, sort of about what they are working on related to impacts, secondary impacts of technology, disruptive technology, uh, and maybe one issue that like they've been really focused on, think is important, and what would really be cool is have you change your thinking about that issue over the, over the course of the last two days. So I'm gonna start uh, with uh, ask Giovanni to start, and uh, Giovanni's done wonderful work at the University of California, Davis, around travel modeling, travel behavior, and he did a great show first study, so I'm hoping maybe you get a chance to work that in, but any event, any event why, don't you, why don't you kick us off? Thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the invitation to be in this conference. Uh, um, we at the University of California Davis, we have this uh, new program that we launched last year. It's called the Three Revolution Fusion Mobility Program. And our purpose is really to develop research that uh, helps understand the impacts of what we call the three revolutions in transportation, disruptive technologies like shared mobility, autonomous vehicles, and vehicle electrification. And uh, many of you were last week, uh, we hosted in Davis a big conference, the Three Revolution Conference. Uh, and that really summarizes uh, the purpose of our program, which is to develop research and to develop studies that help understand better the phenomenon in transportation and support with that uh, policy making, support policies that can align the interests of the industry, the industry of the government, with the industry of the societal benefits, uh, and try to make sure that we don't get negative externalities on the environment, on equity, on the economy, but we can actually harvest uh, some of the positive benefits that can derive from this, uh, um, uh, this technology's adoption. And uh, being here in this uh, uh, conference this week uh, just uh, reinforces uh, our mission. Uh, we see really we have uh, big importance to work together to try to develop policies which are uh, leading the future of transportation in a way that is going to be more equitable, better for the environment, better for the economy of the country. And we need to do strong work for this. Uh, uh, the impacts on urban form, on the increase in travel demand, on a lot of changes that can happen on the use of transit, we know there's a lot of work to do with this. And the mission of our program is that. Uh, I invite all of you to visit the 3rev.ucdavis.edu where you can find a lot of information about some of the work that we do in the areas of share mobility on some of the pilots uh, understanding the changes with autonomous vehicle uh, adoption and also some of the naturalistic experiment like what David mentioned with the chauffeur program, uh, uh, project. And also we have all the presentations for the conference last week that you can uh, check there on our website. Uh, thanks Giovanni. I'll turn next to uh, Rebecca who is a research director for sustainable cities initiative at the University of Oregon. Go Ducks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so you've heard a lot about what we're doing here, so I won't go into great detail about all of our work. Um, you know that we've done, we've started to think about these issues and we've done work um, specifically on municipal budgets through Ben Clark here um, and AVs and bikes with Mark Schlossberg. Uh, my own personal work um, focuses mostly on housing and land use. Um, so I presented yesterday on some work that I've done on the impact of Airbnb in rural communities um, here in Oregon. So um, a lot of my own work works on rural areas and so we haven't talked a lot at this conference about rural areas, but that's something really important we need to think about moving forward. Um, and then the other uh, project I've been involved in is through my class, which I'll talk about a little bit more later on, um, thinking about the impact of autonomous vehicles on transportation budgets. 
Um, so what I've heard from this conference that's reinforced some of my thinking about this already um, is the need for responsive and adaptive regulation. So um, I'll talk about this um, a little bit more later on when we talk about uh, academia, but um, I think it's really important that we harness what we heard from the private sector um, industry panel um, to think about ways that we're more flexible um, in our regulations. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and pass it on to others. Uh, okay, thanks, Rebecca. I'll turn next to Conrad, who's at the University of Cincinnati and an architect, I understand, by training, and has really done some great research on the shape and shaping of cities, both in the U.S. and Europe, and I, I believe has been looking at e-commerce and what some of the impacts of e-commerce will have on retail form and agglomeration. Yes, that's correct. So um, I do a lot of research on urban forms, so talking about secondary effects, right, so AV technology, e-commerce as well. Um, I love apocalypse, <laughs> I'll have to be honest, so um, you can uh, soon read my, my book, I have a new book coming out on Detroit, um, so really studying sort of path dependency as well, so you get these external influences on urban form, what does that do with cities? And finding, uh, perhaps a bit ominously, that history does repeat itself, and I, I will get back to that uh, later as well. Thanks, Conrad. And uh, last, we have not least, we have Billy Riggs, uh, who, I, who I, a, a good friend of mine, uh, who's a widely uh, recognized thought leader in the area of transportation, housing, economics, and emerging technology. I found that in the web, and it must be true because if folks have seen the current issue of The Economist. There's a special section on automated vehicles, special report, I urge you to check it out. There's an article on urban planning and Billy's uh, quoted in the article. So uh, what do you think about all this? Well, I get to be humbled. <laughs> um, so Billy Riggs, uh, I'm a professor of management at the University of uh, San Francisco and uh, recovering transportation planner, economist, and engineer. Um, and I think that um, my past work has really focused on uh, urban design, streetscapes, uh, and, and how that relates to local economies and land use. And I'm finding that many times what my role is and the way it's transitioning is really starting to work with people at Urban Is Up Next, people at institutions around the country in developing um, a movement. And I, you know, I, I like to think that none of us own these ideas, none of us own this topic. Um, that we're really developing a collective or consorting, a consortium of thoughts that can really shape the future of our cities uh, beyond the topic of, of autonomous vehicles and the other things. We're really creating the places we want to be and the places we want to see. And so if I had kind of one kind of guiding uh, principle, it's really, it's, it's really that. It's about humanity and livability and, and creating happy and lovely places. Uh, thanks, Billy. Uh, so we'll move to the next question, and again, we're going to keep this pretty informal. I'm going to ask uh, one of our panelists to start it off and, uh, us off, and everyone chime in with your thoughts. But I'll, I'll start Re with Rebecca, and the question is, again, how are these changes that have been discussed over the last couple of years, how do you think that's going to change the academy, academia, research, education, and all the things that the universities do? Um, so I want to uh, start by going back to what um, SCI tries to do and think about this as a way to merge the, the public and the private sector in a lot of these issues. So we try to do work that's interdisciplinary, applied, and focused on sustainability. So as Nico said, we try to get out of the ivory tower, um, and we do that not just through research, but also through involving students in these projects. Um, so when I started as research director at SCI, we kind of had two arms of the research side of things and the sustainable city year side of things, um, which is getting classes to do real work for, pro uh, for cities um, around on lots of different topics. Um, this year we first piloted um, an attempt to do sustainable city year projects through TriMet, some of uh, the TriMet folks are here, um, that focus on urbanism next topics. Um, and that was the, the work that we did in my public budgeting class in the fall to look at the impact of um, transportation um, and IVs on AVs on transportation budgets and think about innovative options. Um, students love this opportunity to think about something that's brand new. Um, they're going to be the ones that are acting in this environment. And so we have to train students not to be relying on our old models of thinking about how we plan for transportation and how we zone land and these other sorts of things. We have to train them to be agile and responsive and adapt to these new changes um, and think critically about a lot of these issues. Um, so by involving students 
students in these projects and getting them to think about these issues now, um, we're starting to do that. And it's really exciting to hear the ideas um, of this, this sort of other generation um, and think about how that affects um, things into the future. Thanks, Rebecca. Anyone like to add on? Well, let me chime in to say, uh, in academia, usually we are used to work with certain timelines, huh? and we are now dealing with topics that are evolving very quickly. We have a dynamic of a technology and changes that are happening in society with adoption of a shopping or many other technologies uh, that are really changing every week, every month, like, you know, very quickly. And that uh, brings also a challenge for us, uh, for all the academic working in the academic sector. Uh, the traditional model of uh, starting a project that requires a long time for the time an initial <laughs> proposal is submitted to a funding agency, we get a project, we develop some results, we submitted them for publication in the journal. In 2021, we published something about something that has been developed this year that talks about what was the situation of share mobility in 2018 and or in 2016 where we collected our data. So clearly this model doesn't work because we are working in an, in an environment in which in 2021 we will have a completely different uh, uh, organization of our technology society. Uh, Lyft, uh, uh, Debs was mentioning before, Lyft was funding six years ago. A lot of our projects were envisioned six years ago. So uh, this is a big challenge and it, this requires also flexible work environment and changing mentality and uh, some of us are already aware of this, but we also need to make uh, this awareness more uh, prevalent in the academic sector, and maybe also rethink the way of communicating our results, uh, in particular for making an impact in the society. So from this point of view, I think the Urbanism Next is a great uh, model in bringing together academic leaders uh, with uh, the private sector, with planners, to make sure that we have a real implementation of the work that we do in the academic sector, that we don't develop something that just say in a bookshelf somewhere. I have to ask you a quick question about that. Do you think it's possible that funders will change their model to be more, uh, you know, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, quicker, and or is that just wishful thinking? Well, of course, it depends on the funders. Uh, like uh, uh, certain type of funding, like uh, the National Science Foundation funding, is uh, uh, related to certain type uh, of uh, uh, funding processes. But we have agencies that know that we have a quick response projects, for instance. Uh, we've been working with some state DOTs uh, that they have a process in which we can request uh, small grants that can be executed in just a few weeks from the time I requested. And that's a great model. Uh, another model is, for instance, uh, the type of work we've been doing, for instance, in our uh, environment at UC Davis, uh, with directly the private sector in which we have uh, a number of industry partners. Uh, some of them are also the sponsors of this conference, including uh, Lyft and Uber and some automakers. And we have uh, very motivated industry partners that actually partner with us in developing projects. And they, are, they know that we need to develop projects in a quick way. Okay, thanks. If I could just, yeah, yeah, I think one of the things that I want to add, and, and one of the, I think, the challenges I see to um, the academy right now is that the same thing that happens in the planning sector is that we, we think about our profession and market verticals. Um, and, you know, we, a lot of the discussion, for example, with this conference has, has been on the transportation market vertical. And if I had a, a concern for academics is that we continue to segment into these verticals and, and we suffer from what I call, uh, well, from confirmation bias. And a couple years ago, I, I published a paper um, where it was, the title was the, Hampered by Hardcoreness. And I, many times I think that we in the transportation profession become blinded by our passion for our topic. And we, we make assumptions about uh, the propensity towards shared, the propensity towards um, what I call bicycle biters, uh, bicycle bias. And we put on our, our confirmation by in helmets and we fail to see people that are, to empathize with people that are much different than us. And I think that's a constant challenge for the academy in terms of really looking at some of these issues of behavior and uh, the relationship with emerging technology and smart and emerging mobility and how, how people will use it. And I, I, I come from the Midwest, not too far from where Conrad has his appointment. And uh, I know that, that their relationship with uh, smart mobility is much different than it is on the West Coast. And I think us embracing that, those differences, but also thinking about different approaches, to, behavioral approaches to this is very important. And we have to remember that. And we also have to remember not to deal with these topics in isolation. Um, and that's we can't be um, transportation enthusiasts without actually thinking about um, 
where people are going. Um, and we've talked a lot about jobs and the, e the economy at this point, but I, you know, many of our large cities have an acute problem with housing. And if you attended our panel a couple days ago, you know, I, th I believe like kind of the housing plus transportation s synergistic discussion is perhaps a little absent right now from, from the autonomous vehicle and smart mobility dialogue. And maybe we are to start happening, having the, the housing plus transportation discussion uh, in parallel at this type of forum. Just um, a short comment. First of all, um, very good comment on connecting research with teaching. So a lot of the work that I do is connecting my research agenda to teaching, which is the only place where I can speculate about the future. If I go to an academic conference uh, and I say, well, this is what I think is going to happen, it would be discredited immediately. Um, I mean, in the field of e-commerce, what tends to happen is my colleagues disappear um, a lot of knowledge that is created becomes proprietary relatively quickly. Because once you have a very valuable insight, it goes away. Um, E-commerce publications in the academic world are, are rather few and far between, and again, very uh, unspeculative, because the speculators work not so much in academia, they work in the private industry. Um, so there's, there's a major disconnect in that. So, Again, in my teaching in urban design studios, that's where I try to make that connection. Those studios rarely make it to places like this that connect with the larger, the larger world. They, they connect to singular clients. So again, I'm very happy to, uh, to see this audience. This is a rare occasion for me to be at a place like this. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Carmen. I'm actually going to stick with you, and I'm going to just speculate. Uh, uh, what if the University of Cincinnati came up with a million dollars? like the University of Oregon did, for something for you to, to, to really dig in in terms of research. What would that be? We, uh, we just received a $15 million endowment, believe it or not. So okay. we are well, actually... Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> University of Oregon, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to dig in next? You know, we're really kind of thinking about um, urban futures as part of our university mission uh, of making an urban impact. We try to be a good neighbor in the city of Cincinnati. We are by no means anywhere close to where Portland is in terms of transportation, equity. Uh, we are lucky, perhaps, that we have lower housing values. Um, so we're really trying to position. <laughs> I see some people laughing. Uh, that, that is a good thing. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a good position to be in in certain ways because um, we, can, we can really think about future opportunities that other cities do not have. Uh, we have a longer way to go. At this point in time, it really is mostly going toward academic research, but especially after going to this conference, I am going to go back to university leaders and say that I think we can make a much bigger impact connecting with the, the industry and the profession as well. So uh, thanks for, uh, for giving that. And we should note that you know, SCI has definitely um, provided a path for this type of community engagement and service learning. And we should be, you know, we should be grateful for, for SCI for, kind of, for that platform that they've provided in terms of connecting cities with academia. So thank you for SCI for starting, starting that. And hopefully we can build on it. Do you have any thoughts, Giovanni? Yeah, uh, well, that is like, you know, something like, you know, a challenge that I think all of us we are, we're facing. Uh, uh, we in California, we are lucky from this point of view because we have good connections with the cities to apply our results. And that is like, you know, one of the, 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 the challenges that we are working on. Uh, there is so much to do, but also at the same time, it's nice to see the interest in learning from the, uh, uh, from the, 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 the researcher to implement in policies. So our million, we use it actually like, you know, to get better data collection, to get our um, projects to become like, you know, useful and impactful in terms of uh, um, informing planning processes. And uh, it's important to see already like, you know, uh, on the other side, uh, uh, partners that are willing to work with us, but I think we need to do much more to create this envir collaborative environment to work all together in the making a better world. And Rebecca, I'm gonna, I have a question for you, so okay. maybe reframe your thought, because I was thinking <laughs> as you were talking that the, sort of the issue of equity and access has mm -hmm. come up over and over again at this conference, and I agree, and I'll be the first to admit the planning profession has not been great, uh, very good at dealing with equity issues. And, we're trying, but it's a struggle. So I'm wondering, thinking about it again around the lens of, re, of the academy, research, education, are there any thoughts on what you might do, to, we might do to advance 
some of these issues related to disruptive technology? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I'll frame it a little bit broadly. I think equity is a really important impact that we need to consider in our research and our teaching, and it's something that in the academy, um, particularly within our own department, has been expanding in terms of interest and impact. Um, I've only been a faculty member for a few short years, and I've seen a complete shift in terms of how we think about communicating about those issues. And I see students coming in that are really advanced and they're thinking about these things, and that's amazing to see and amazing to, to work with. But as we think about the, the sort of academic sector as it relates to the public and private sector, I hope that this has shown all of you in both, uh, in both sides that the academic can be a bridge between the public and private sector um, and that you can see us as a resource to help advance things. Um, so something that we've done a lot in the Sustainable City Year program, um, as I mentioned, we work across lots of different boundaries. So you heard from someone in journalism earlier today. Um, we work with business professors. We work with, um, obviously, uh, urban design, architecture, planning but we work across the university, um, which is really helpful to think about things outside of our silos, um, but we also can push the boundaries. So as um, Conrad was saying earlier, you get the chance to be innovative when you're in the classroom and say things you might not be able to say in an academic conference without getting booed off the stage, but we can also help cities be more innovative and let our students push the boundaries. So the, the <coughs> cities might not be able to be as forceful about thinking about equity issues or willing to do that, um, but we can get around some of those political barriers within cities um, by doing some of this work within the classroom and letting students um, do that. And that's been really uh, great and useful for us. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And uh, we have one more question that we'll go through, and then hopefully we'll have time for a few questions from the audience. But that's a good segue into the next question. I'm, I'm going to turn to Billy on this: is how can academia engage with the private sector, with pra uh, with practitioner? I'm a planning practitioner and communities to advance this work. Wow. Um, Big question. Thank, thank you. This has been a great discussion. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to say three specific things, and, and one of them is kind of bundled. As I, we had this phenomenon at Transportation Research Board this year where um, CES happened at the same time. And those of you that were at TRB, there was much consternation because we have a lot of these uh, emerging mobility and technology solutions, and the representatives from those type of companies couldn't engage with the entire academic transportation and planning engineering body because the conferences just simply overlapped. So there could be something as simple as figuring out how to um, jointly bring, you know, if, if us transportation folk just want to just say, we're going to boycott this, this, this engineering national academy for a couple years and we're going to engage only in the consumer electronics show, maybe that's the right thing to do. Maybe we should be doing that and, and we should all be going to South by Southwest next, next week. Um, I, I think I'd candidly like to do that. But I mean, I think that's the only way we're going to address two really elephant in the room topics. And I know that my colleagues from places like Farron Piers and Arup and Nelson Nygaard are dealing with, you know, a defunct trip generation manual and, and highway capacity manual and, and just straight up, uh, VM, you know, LOS type standards that just don't work from a, from a land use planning standpoint. And I think that is that if we had an imperative from a research standpoint in, in bridging professional practice, academia and professional practice, that would be um, item one. And then the, the, I think the, that's, so that's one and two, and I think the third thing for me really is this imperative for uh, data sharing. And I, I think we've heard from a number of, 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 of vendors over the past years, and, and we still in academia are operating in a data vacuum and data is shared incrementally, uh, and many academics have to operate in, a, in an era where they have to collect data themselves. And if you follow the news, my colleague Stephen Zonf uh, actually recently published a, a study, uh, and he used all of his own data, and he made an error. And you've seen the news today, he apologized for the one error, and he wants to work with some of the companies about that. But the point of that is, and the point of that narrative, that story is, it's a teachable moment for for academics as well as uh, TNCs and AV companies is that we have to figure out a way to share data and to evolve our way of communication. And uh, we understand there are limitations to proprietary information from an academic standpoint, but I think that, that conversation needs to be had. And I think if I could issue a challenge to uh, the private sector is that let's, let's figure out a way to create a, an independently managed and blind repository uh, for data, particularly in the TNC world and dealing with AV disengagements that allows for academics to really investigate what's happening and it allows for us across platforms 
and, and across companies. And I think that's, that, it's been done in the medical profession, and it's been done to do, to do medical and drug trials, and I think that is really big opportunity that we should start talking about, and I'm happy to engage and, and, and help assist in that conversation. But I think that's a key opportunity that we ought to take away from this conference. Wow, you asked a big question, you got a big, a big answer. That was great. Uh, you, you have some thoughts on it? Yeah, can I just, you know, in, I completely agree in terms of adding extra depth to data. I would actually like to make a case today also about adding a, a more horizontal spread. So a lot of what I've seen over the past three days is um, there's a sense of inevitability, essentially. There's the heaven or hell scenario. We don't really know how to bend one way or another. And in future iteration of this conference, I would um, argue to perhaps start thinking more also about culture and politics to get some people that are probably not in this room right now. So if you think, for instance, AV technology, um, think about, um, you know, I was shocked to hear at this conference only 3% of American real estate changes each year. So there's something that's incredibly inert. And think about that path dependence there as well. So why would AVs re-urbanize America? Why wouldn't they continue to de-urbanize America? That's a question of culture and politics, as perhaps people might want to talk about that as well. I mean, in terms of e-commerce, it's, it's a very similar story. I mean, Amazon.com, that's great, but uh, remember Sears 100 years ago? They kind of did the same thing, you know? They started offline, went back to brick and mortar. Perhaps there's things we can learn from the history profession as well. So talk about some of the, some of the historians as well. Um, the sharing economy, gig economy, labor unions up in arms, um, that is ultimately a political matter. Think about automation and losing jobs. Uh, Henry Ford, uh, certainly not out of the goodness of his heart, um, created the middle class in, in the city of Detroit through automation as well. So there's certain questions that might require, and I know, you know it might require that step back that perhaps academics can offer as well. So I'd like to make it that. That's great. Let me jump in uh, with a couple of comments. Uh, uh, linking to what Billy was actually mentioning about like, you know, the study that was uh, sparkling some controversy. Uh, I think like, you know, I take two lessons uh, out of that. Uh, one of these is the involvement and the other one is being humble. And involvement meaning that uh, if uh, in our studies we cooperate with the others, we get the early feedback, actually we can shape together research questions and approaches that are actually more agreed on rather than uh, uh, sometimes academics like to get in love with an idea until they, they just like, you know, crash into the wall and somebody says, no, that was a float study. And, and so that is like, you know, a big uh, uh, lesson. And the other thing is like, you know, about being humble is that uh, uh, the example of the highway capacity manual is a typical example. Sometimes we, uh, especially engineers, uh, and I'm an engineer, so I can criticize engineers. Uh, we think that there is a method, there is a solution that needs to be implemented. And the reality is that the reality is very varied. There are a lot of different situations uh, and different solutions apply to different places. And so this is typical in travel demand modeling, for instance. Uh, the, the, the ambition of travel demand forecasting models uh, to have uh, ability with rather simple tool in the end that cannot represent the complexity of human behaviors uh, to predict numbers. And these tools we know nowadays they are really like, you know, unable to predict what is the future of travel demand, but still we are required today to use these tools to make a future assessment of projects uh, and to uh, plan future cities in, uh, in practice. And we need to rethink that and also know that we need to have a better understanding, but also we will need to have customized solution for each different context that will probably be very different one for each other. And what is good for New York City uh, is very different probably from a rural area, from a suburban community. And we need to try to understand the local characteristics to try to find customized solution that integrate technology into that. And not be scared of the future, but try to work together with the innovations that are introduced to build a better future. And we need to rethink in that, all the planning and modeling process to, in order to support that. Okay, Rebecca, you get the last word, and then we'll have about a few minutes left, so if people want to line up at the microphone, people ought, ought to be able to do a couple of questions at least. I'll keep it short um, for the interest of uh, allowing questions, um, but I wanted to echo what Billy said about sort of data repository and analysis. Um, in the workshop I was in yesterday afternoon, we talked a lot about sort of the lack of 
um, government agencies to have data analysts and um, analytics people within. Um, and so they have data, but they don't really know what to do with it yet, or they don't really know how to analyze it. So even if they've cooperated with Uber and Lyft and Airbnb to get the information, they're not really sure what to do with it next. And the academic sector can play a really great role in that. Um, we love to get access to data, um, and we love to have things uh, to work with to analyze, and we either have uh, you know, lots of teams of students that can help with it, um, or uh, we ourselves are looking for, for research questions and having data to answer it. So, um, the, I mean, the other, the other side of this is thinking about whether the academic sector can be um, this repository for the information and um, maybe protect it from FOIA requests or other sorts of things. And there's lots of legal questions I don't know the answers to, um, but I think this idea of thinking about the academics as being able to help with um, some of the data is a really good point. Can I just shortly respond? In, in, in my field of, of commerce, that's, uh, that's a big deal to have um, the recommendations of academia being openly accessible, especially uh, smaller cities, small towns that are trying to reinvent their main streets. Again, a lot of this knowledge is proprietary, so if there is an open access platform, that would be very, very useful for those cities that cannot afford uh, consultants. Thanks, and we have a question. Yes, <clears throat> excellent uh, panel, thank you. Um, in your self-introduction, Conrad, you uh, alluded to a book that was coming out and uh, <laughs> it really uh, interested me and I'm wondering if you could expand on that. Okay, so um, <laughs> I'll try to keep it on topic. It's, it's a book about 200 years of downtown Detroit, uh, looking at the urban form of downtown Detroit, how it changed, but how it changed as a result of all these external factors that were thrown upon it. Um, and to be very honest, it's good to see a multidisciplinary audience is the, the uh, agency of the traditional professions in how downtown shaped was incredibly small and usually negative. Uh, I can uh, already tell you that. So, um, I mean, ultimately, urban form is, is just the resultant of, of larger economic forces. Is by the time you try to row against these forces, uh, it's usually too late. So by the t I'm, I, I, I know it's a very negative story. I mean, if you've been to downtown Detroit, uh, perhaps you can see why, although it's, it's revitalizing. Um, it's the weird people that ultimately made a difference. You know, it's a guy in 1920 that said, you know what, I'm going to start the first parking lot in downtown Detroit, and uh, it's a pretty good business model. And, you know, by the time the planners came in thinking, what did we do? You know, that was 1941 when they had their first zoning plan, for example. So, um, look at the quiet people in this room. That's all I can say. Uh, I, I would say that one thing that's embedded in that comment um, that Conrad would just make was, was the need and imperative to evolve policy faster. And I think the latency that was just relayed is a big concern from everybody on this dais and hopefully everybody on the next, uh, the next panel as well is that Planning goes too slow. You know, oh, Mark Schlossberg and I were talking about how it goes slower than nature now. Um, so the things decompose faster than my local planning commission, which I'm unfortunately on, uh, works. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Yvonne or Rebecca, you have a last word you want to say? We still have a minute or two. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> um, I, to echo Billy's point about responsive regulations, I think we've talked a lot about transportation at this conference and talked a lot about um, accommodating Uber and Lyft and being responsive in that way. Um, but um, the comment that was made on the on the private sector panel around thinking about housing and how we overcome barriers to info and these other sorts of things. Um, and something that's really sparked my interest over the conference from the Amazoning panel through yesterday's workshop um, has been this idea of uh, responsive regulation. So we were tasked yesterday with coming up with um, options for where did the money go. And what we really talked about was regulations and thinking about when we suddenly have too much retail land, how do we automatically um, allow for residential or something else to go on that land? So how do we rethink our zoning systems to be more responsive to that? Um, I think that's something that um, we all in this room need to work towards. And I will link the, my closing thoughts uh, related to the regulations, the need for regulations. Uh, um, there is a lot of enthusiasm today for innovation technology, it's great, but there's also a lot of sometimes uh, um, anachronistic uh, optimism about 
what the innovation can bring. Uh, and everybody thinks, oh, it's going to be shared, it's nice, it's beautiful, it's autonomous. Uh, and certainly, autonomous vehicles will bring some benefits. Uh, if we think, for instance, the people with mobility, disabili uh, dis uh, some disabilities, and they cannot really uh, are impaired in their travel, it's going to be great. Uh, but at the same time, it brings a lot of challenges, uh, like uh, increasing demand. We know that a lot of users will not share spontaneously. And so some unpopular choices will be needed. Uh, and this is the time, actually, to help support uh, the regulations, uh, help support the regulations which are pretty progressive and thinking about changing like uh, uh, even basic things how transportation is funded today with the gas tax. They will need to move into a user fee or other ways uh, to actually charge users uh, and this make it become at the same time something that is good for the society in a way that we can actually contain demand and we can uh, use our system more efficiently like promoting sharing for instance but at the same time equitable because we know that in rural areas, in areas that uh, are more low density, it will be very difficult to share. And for instance, if we have a higher user fees for vehicles that are only occupied by one person, we might have actually very bad impacts in disadvantaged communities. So a lot of challenges, and we need to try to deal with them today, even if the results will only become like, you know, evident uh, tomorrow. And it's very difficult, as many economists always remind us, uh, to charge something that is already provided for free, and so before the adoption of autonomous vehicles, we need to start thinking about the pricing and the correct way to fund the transportation in the future. And that is very related also to the evolution of cities, how the urban form will evolve together with the transportation system. So that's, I think, is the challenge that we have ahead of us and that we have a lot of work to do in, in this area. Give a hand to the panel.